Well, hello everybody. Uh, I hope that you're doing okay. This is Ralph Fletcher and this is Writing with Ralph. And this is the ninth session we've done. We're going to be talking about memoir writing. Here in New Hampshire, um, things are starting to like turn a little bit. We're getting some forsythia and daffodils, although this morning it snowed pretty hard for about uh, 20 minutes and that was kind of discouraging. But the snow has all vanished now and so things are, are looking up a little bit. Um, I thought I'd start by reading a, a piece from uh, my book, Ordinary Things, um, just because it sort of captures how I'm feeling right now. It's called Soon. Soon the clouds like dark dough pressed against invisible glass. Soon the rain to turn the grass so green it will make you stare. Soon the nests filled with chirps raining down like confetti bits. Soon you'll be able to walk at night, breathing sweet blossoms unseen. <clears throat> and you can see that I'm eager for spring, which is happening very slowly here. <clears throat> so I must say that um, I've been inviting students to share their writing with me and send it to me. And I got some, I got some good stuff um, <clears throat> from students and also from teachers and even for some, from some moms and dads. Um, so I thought I'd just read you a couple things. This is um, a piece that was written by Payal. I think that I'm saying that right. And um, well, that comes, this comes all the way from um, Prune, India. The good old days. Sometimes I remember the good old days, sitting in the charpoy under the huge starry blanket, the leaves of the banyan tree, singing a lullaby, the cool air giving a good night kiss, the crickets awakening from a good day's sleep. I still can't imagine anything better than that. Um, I looked it up and I found out that a charpoy is a, is a bed that sort of got little posts that hold it up. Um, and, um, but I love that line, um, the crickets awakening from a good day's sleep and they coming out at night. And I also got another piece by um, Jax Johnson, who um, writes about what he's a straight-A student in. And um, I'm not going to read you this whole piece because it was a little bit long, but there's some wonderful moments in it. Um, and, well, I'll just read it. Some kids' talents are sports, dance, drawing, or singing. Mine? Well, I'm pretty good at climbing and not so bad at basketball. And my mom tells me I'm pretty great at music but my real talent is being an A plus bone breaker. Some kids maybe have broken one bone or maybe sprained an ankle or wrist, but me, I've broken four bones. Lucky me. My first break was at my grandparents' house. I was three years old. I thought it would be a really cool stunt if I jumped off the sofa under my grandpa's exercise ball and then bounced off and stuck my landing. Well, it didn't go according to plan. As soon as I jumped onto the exercise ball, I got launched off and nearly broke and nearly did a backflip. I landed weird on my wrist and crack, broken. And then he goes through and talks about the other breaks that he's had in his life. And I'll just read you the last paragraph. This is the way he concludes it. You may wonder, am I done breaking bones? Hopefully. But let's be honest and say I'm probably not knowing my luck in history. I'm hoping my next break will be a really nice long break from breaking bones. But if I have to break one more, I'm rooting for a leg because I've always wanted to try out crutches. <laughs> All right. So, um, we're going to be talking about memoir writing, and um, it's a big topic. Um, and I thought what I would do is give you a few tips, or not really tips, because memoir is one of those topics that you don't really give tips about. Well, I guess you do, but it's, it's kind of a big topic. Um, but I'm going to give you a few thoughts, and then I'm going to read you... Um, a chapter from from Marshfield Dreams. Um, so, the, I really am, I'm going to talk about two things, and the first thing is the importance of focusing when you write memoir. When you write memoir, it's very easy to get floaty, to say too much, and to get too vague. Um, and the reader really wants to know, well, what's this story about? The story is about you, um, of course. But it's also about something else, and the reader kind of wants to know what that something else is. So to me, 
Um, a strong memoir idea, and this is probably true for all writing, but I'm focusing on memoir right now. A strong idea should be small and big. And let's talk about what I mean by that, small and big. Well, when I say small, I mean it's focused on one thing. Let's say you, you're writing about a baseball glove that your brother passed down to you. Or maybe there was a golf club that your grandfather gave you. Um, in my book, Marshfield Memories, um, I have a chapter that just focuses on the transistor radio that I got as a kid. Uh, a little radio, pocket radio that I could take with me into my bed at night, listen to music or listen to a baseball game. Um, and um, in Marshfield Dreams, I have a chapter that focuses on the first pen I got. The first pen that had ink in it. My first big pen and um, what that was like. It's a very short chapter um, called First Pen. Um, so these subjects are important to notice that they're very physical. I mean, they're things. They're tangible. So it gives me a chance to describe them. Um, so in a way, you can see that they're small. But at the same time, they're big. And what I mean by big is that they're about something else also. Um, so the chapter about my first pen is about that pen, but it's also about my desire to start expressing myself through writing. You know, I wanted to write stories. I wanted to create something. Um, and the chapter about the transistor radio, yeah, it's about that radio, but it's also about my desire for privacy and to have something of my own. Um, in our family, privacy was really short supply. We didn't have much of it, none of us. And so I wanted something that would kind of block out the craziness of my family and that I could just have to myself. Um, and so you see what I mean? Both those chapters and those topics are both small and big. Um, and so I'd, I'd like you to think about that as you consider writing some memoir for yourself. Think about something that's, that's small but also big. We'll talk a little, little bit about, about that at the end of our, our session here. And the other thing I wanted to talk to you about and this is a challenging topic in a way, but I want to talk about difficult topics to write about. Difficult things, hard things that we write about. Um, I will just put it to you very simply that life is hard. Um, even a life that's happy and fulfilling, like mine, I've had a great life. I've got wonderful kids. I've had some success in writing. I've traveled all over the place. I've got a wonderful family that I love and they, they care about me. I've got great friends. I mean, I've, I've got my health. I've got so many things to be grateful about. But at the same time, I've had heartache in my life. I've had hard things that have happened to me. Um, and so everybody who has a life has some heartache. It's part of the deal. Um, it's what it means to be alive. Um, somebody betrays you. Somebody hurts your feelings or makes you feel silly or belittles you. Um, everybody suffers. And um, I don't want to dwell on the negative, uh, especially during this time of the coronavirus when there's so many, well, not like negative things, but so much uncertainty that we're kind of like uh, thinking about and worried about. And um, But I do think that when you write memoir, it's important to talk about the importance of writing about the difficult stuff, because that often is what makes the writing really work and make it comes and make, makes it come alive. Um, so what do people do when they write about difficult subjects? Well, I think people do a couple things. Oftentimes, um, they just leave it out. You know, they just take out all the bad stuff. Um, and, um, the memoir reads like a series of happy, amusing occasions. Um, and, and that's nice in a way, but it re rings kind of false to the reader. Um, and it, it doesn't really, the reader knows that some of the stuff has obviously been um, edited out of, of that writing. So that's one thing people do. And the second thing people do, and I'm, I'm saying this because I've done it too, is that when they write about um, difficult people or things that happen to them, they soften it. They write nice. I'm, I'm going to use that quote, they write nice. And what I mean by that is they write not as I'm going to say we. We write not as we see them, but we write as we know they would want to see themselves. Um, and again, it rings false. Now look, we're all nice people. We don't want to be cruel. We don't want to hurt anybody with our writing. 
But when you write memoir, you have to be honest. You have to tell the truth of your life. That's kind of the one of the unspoken um, agreements between the memoirist and and the uh, and the reader. And you know we can say write honest, and it sounds easy and sounds something we can just do, but it's not that easy. Um, I love uh, Cynthia Ryland's books. Um, I think she's a, a masterful writer. Writer. She's one of the people that. Um, has inspired me as a writer over the years. And I know that I'm not alone. Many people uh, would say the same thing. So she wrote a memoir called, But I'll Be Back Again. When she was growing up um, in Appalachia, she loved two things. She loved the Beatles and she loved Bobby Kennedy. And the Beatles have a song uh, called, But I'll Be Back Again. And just just listen to the way she starts this memoir. Um, I'm going to re read you just the first paragraph. If you were a child who has never told the truth, you begin to make up your own. After my father left, and no one mentioned his name again, I simply made up things about him. When the teacher in fourth grade asked me where he was, I said he was in San Francisco on business. He had been gone since I was four, so I guess I could have said that he'd been in San Francisco on business for five years. But of course, San Francisco was just another invention of mine, trying to make a father for myself out of nothing. I had no idea where he was or what he was doing. Wow. I mean... She just doesn't waste any time. She gets right in there, and just the the honesty of that writing gives me a clue as a reader that this is an author who's going to be telling the truths, even the hard truths, about her life. Um, I re I'd recommend this book, too, uh, but I'll be back again. Um, so I want you to remember this, and, and it's, you know, this is something to think about, <clears throat> that <clears throat> when you write your story, um, you're writing not the truth, but you're writing your truth, okay? And, and I would just say it like this. You have a right to your story. You have a right to your story. Um, I love this quote by uh, the, the great writer. Well, she's a wonderful writer that I've been uh, inspired by, uh, Anne Lamott. She wrote Bird by Bird, among other wonderful books. But she puts it like this. She says, tell your stories. You own everything that happened to you. And then she sort of says playfully, if, you wanted to, if, if people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better, <laughs> which I think is funny. But I love that line. You, you own everything that happened to you. Um, so I am going to read um, chapter from my book, Marshall Dreams, um, The Last Kiss. And I'm going to use my glasses so that I can make sure I read all these pages and these words. Okay, The Last Kiss. And it's got a picture of uh, my father there on the cover. And you can, I love that picture. My, my father was such an amazingly handsome man. He, I mean, he really was. Last Kiss. Dad and Mom always kissed us good night before we went to bed. Dad kissed my right cheek. Mom, I left. After that, I got under the covers and it was an easy glide to sleep. These kisses were a regular part of the bedtime routine, like brushing my teeth, having the nightly bowl of cereal, or hearing a story before lights out. It felt like having air to breathe or blanket to keep me warm. Automatic. And I never gave it a second thought. One night, I finished my bedtime bowl of cereal and went to Mom. Sleep tight, she murmured, kissing me on the cheek. Night, Mom. I found Dad sitting at the desk in his office. I'm going to bed, I told him. Well, good night. And to my surprise, he reached out and shook my hand. At first, I just stood there, confused. Finally, I took his hand and shook it the way I'd seen men shake hands. Sleep tight, he said. Then he turned away from me and went back to his paperwork. Feeling more surprised than hurt, I headed off to bed. Next night, I gave it another shot. After eating my bowl of cereal, I went to Mom. She kissed me and gave me a long big hug that built up my courage before I went to my dad. I found him out on the driveway. He was packing the trunk of his car, getting ready to go on a business trip. Hey, he said, straightening up. Bedtime? Yep. I moved toward him. Good night. He wrapped his arms around me and gave me a bear hug. Night. My voice was muffled against his chest. He released me and went back to packing the car. For a few seconds, I didn't move. The night was warm. Fireflies were out, floating in the evening breeze. They made me think of the jellyfish Dad and I saw one night, about a year before, when we were on a dock at the beach. I noticed lights flickering in the dark water and was amazed to find out that they were living animals. 
How can they light up like that? I had asked my dad. They make their own light, he explained, like fireflies. How do jellyfish move? I asked him. Do they have fins? No, dad said. But what if they want to see their friends? I asked. How do they get there? They drift in the tide, dad explained. If they're lucky, the tide will help them drift to where they want to go. Well, what if they want to see their friends, but they're not lucky? I asked. He shrugged. Then I guess they drift away from each other. Two more times I went to dad for a goodnight kiss. No luck. Finally, I gave up. Mom still kissed me goodnight on my right cheek, but somehow it didn't feel the same. Her kisses didn't have the same solid feeling they had before. I laid in bed trying to figure it out. Even though I was confused, one thing seemed clear. My father and I had drifted away from each other in a small but important way, a way that I couldn't explain, not even to myself. Ah. <laughs> so, um... It's an emotional chapter, and it's interesting that I um, I had to go through the experience of writing that book when my father was still alive. My dad has passed passed away now uh, a couple of years ago, but when I wrote that chapter and when the book got published, I knew that my dad would be reading it. And um, you know, and it would probably be a little bit of a painful chapter for him to read. Um, but I guess I told myself that it was important for me to tell my story. And also, I will say that in Marshall Dreams, there's another moment later in the book where my dad kind of uh, reaches out to me emotionally and, and kind of redeems himself in that regard. Okay, so, um, thank you for you letting me share that with you. Um, I'd like to just end then um, with just our invitation. And um, my invitation to you is I'd like you to write a memoir story um, and remember it can be very short and my suggestion to you is that you start with something small and tangible okay it should be small and concrete so that you can also describe it but it also shouldn't just be any old object in your house it should be something that's um, important to you a photograph a t-shirt that you won at camp uh, maybe the hardest Boy Scout merit badge that you finally were able to earn a book that your best friend gave you before she moved away. Um, and I would start with that and see what feelings and what memories and what stories are connected to that object um, that you uh, want to have. Because as we said before, um, a good topic for a, for a memoir is both small and big. Okay, but I think that you get at the big stuff through writing about the small stuff. And I want to just leave you with one last thought, and that is that I want you to remember that writers are not people who've had amazing lives. Rather, writers are regular people who find the interesting stories in their ordinary lives. So you can do that. You can tell your story, and uh, remember that I want to hear it. And so if you feel inspired to send it to me or have your parents send it to me, that's my email address, figpudding at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you very much. It was great spending this time with you, and I want you to keep that writing flame lit. Thank you very much.